Hey everyone, welcome back to another video on the aerodynamics of the RC Hypercar. I want to thank you all for the amazing feedback on the previous video, and I've taken your suggestions into account to try to make the visuals for this video cleaner. Before we dive in, if you want to learn more about the basic aerodynamic concepts and the underfloor aerodynamics of this car, make sure you check out my previous video for detailed information. In today's video, we'll be taking a closer look at the aerodynamics of the top side of the car, starting with the front and working our way to the rear of the car. Before I dive into this, I want to give a shout out to AirShaper, who is extremely easy to use cloud-based CFD service I was able to use for all of the CFD work on this car. Uh, check out the link below or above uh, if you want to know more about them. Let's begin with the massive front wing. This wing utilizes a custom airfoil uh, with increased uh, reflex or curvature optimized for turbulent air. Uh, it has a small angle of attack of around 4 degrees. Uh, in comparison, the first element of the rear wing has a much higher angle of attack of 10 degrees, but generates only slightly more downforce than the front wing. This is because the front wing benefits from ground effect. The front wing has a long cord and a low aspect ratio for two reasons. First, it maximizes the ground effect, which is influenced by the airfoil's cord length to ground clearance ratio. Second, the uh, large size of the front wing takes advantage of the high pressure zone created by the car's nose, functioning a lot like a splitter. To improve performance, I curved down the ends of the wing uh, following a design that was common in the previous generation of Formula One cars. Uh, this not only enhances the wing's horizontal expansion, but also generates outwash, which improves downstream aerodynamics. These curved down sections of the wing also act as end plates, preventing the wing from bottoming out on the pavement and actually going into stall. They are thicker than a traditional flat end plate, uh, which just provides greater resistance to impact from rocks on the ground. Additionally, I've added vortex generator tubes on the ends of the wings. Uh, these tubes make it more difficult for the high pressure air on top of the wing to leak down underneath it. Furthermore, there are end plates actually positioned inboard, uh, which serve to block the high pressure air again from being able to come around the uh, airfoil along the sides. The unusual cut of these end plates is due to the fact that at higher angles of yaw, the canards or the dive planes tend to work better with this. However, the data isn't very conclusive and I'm going to try some other end plate designs to hopefully increase the front downforce. To the middle section of the wing, I've incorporated a backed off angle of attack on the airfoil. This forces more fresh air down the middle of the diffuser and provides additional space for the wing's mounting points on the nose. So from this render, you can see just how complex and interconnected the flows around the nose of the car are. To try to make this easier to understand, I want to break down each part of the nose individually first before discussing how they all work together. The wing that connects the nose to the fender serves as the second element of the front wing. It consists of one airfoil oriented two different ways. This airfoil is called the Motorsports High Downforce Airfoil and is designed specifically for race cars. The inner airfoil actually generates upwash uh, similar to all the other airfoils on the car, but the outer airfoil is actually inverted or upside down like an airplane wing. Despite its orientation, the outer airfoil still generates downforce due to the angle of attack, but it facilitates better management of the downstream airflow. If you actually look at the top of the front fenders, they resemble an outwashing airfoil, uh, and this is not by mistake. Although they may not appear to have a streamlined shape in side profile, this style of fender is commonly seen in prototype race cars. The purpose of this shape is to direct air around the sides of the fender rather than over the top of the fender. Some prototypes even take this further with a bulge at the top of the fender to try to force the air around the sides. So by directing more air around the side of the fender, the lift that would be generated on top of the fender is reduced, while the low pressure region on the sides of the fender aids in wheel well air extraction. Canards also play an important role in this process. As the high pressure air actually rolls around the side of the fender, it can be utilized by the canard to generate downforce. 
to achieve this, the canard has to have a, a significant angle of attack and sufficient spacing. But executed correctly, the top of the canard will actually experience high pressure, while the bottom of the canard will have uh, low pressure. And then at the end of the canards, just as the air pressure would start to drop, like on top of the fender, the canard ends abruptly, uh, causing the air to fall off and form a vortex. This vortex effectively pulls additional dirty air out of the wheel well, uh, preventing it from flowing under the car's floor. The canards on the hypercar also curve up and out three-dimensionally, contributing to increased front downforce during yaw when the car is going to be approaching the air at an angle. So something I was asked about in the last video was how do you know which direction a vortex is going to rotate? And that goes back to the fact that high pressure will always flow towards low pressure. So whatever edge the high pressure air falls off of trying to get to the low pressure, that sets up the rotational direction of the vortex. Another interesting feature of the front fender is that we have a concave shape that actually directs the turbulent tire wake and suspension wake out and away from the car. Although a relatively aggressive shape, this acts like a barge board would on a Formula One car, uh, diverting air away from that diffuser entry and pushing it out from the side of the car. As I mentioned, the flows around the nose are intricate. A significant reason for this is the need to evacuate the dirty air that comes up from under the front wing and passes through the suspension arms. To prevent this dirty air from going under the car or through the rear wing, uh, we use a variety of methods to redirect or expel this air. We use vortices and outwash generated by the front wing and the canards that we just talked about to help pull dirty air through the wheel well or direct it into the cooling ducts in the monocoque sides. In combination, we might also use something like a downwashing airfoil on the nose or on the side pods to help redirect the airflow. To provide a better visualization of these airflow patterns, I created a render to demonstrate the layers of the air around the front nose. Uh, the first pink layer represents the airflow that would go under the front wing. Downstream, this air is either pulled out through the wheel well, again due to those vortices generated by the front wing and the canards, or it ends up going into the cooling ducts in the side of the monocoque. The next aqua color layer represents the air that flows over the top of the front wing, but below the second element on the nose. This is where the downwashing airfoil on this portion of the nose tries to prevent the air from just being thrown really high up into the air. If we throw it up high into the air, we can actually generate a lot more front downforce at the nose, but we cause a large area of low pressure over the middle of the car and it lowers the overall effectiveness of the rear wing significantly. Next, the purple layer represents the air actually flowing over the top of the nose. And you can see how tightly we're able to keep this layer with the aqua layer and actually feed those losses that are coming from the aqua layer uh, directly between the rear wing's lower element and the top of the diffuser, uh, really not affecting either one of these uh, aerodynamically. And then finally, this side view shows the orange layer representing the air that directly feeds into the rear wing. And you can see if we had forced the air from the lower layers higher in the front, we'd limit the amount of clean air actually being able to reach the rear wing itself. This is actually why the rear wing ended up being just as tall as it is, so they can catch as much clean air as possible. So now that we kind of understand what's going on with the nose and the fenders and all of that front of the car, let's take a look at the side pods. The top of the side pod has the most significant aerodynamic influence and it's actually shaped like a downwashing and outwashing airfoil. I tried a bunch of different ways to try to get the air coming off of the front of the car to reattach to the body and actually be outwashed away from the sides of the car. One approach involved adding downwashing cow horn devices, which are an inverted airfoil, which proved aesthetically unpleasing, but they actually did work. Ultimately, I just tried curving the top of the side pod down and out, and this ended up being almost as effective as the cow horns. 
To help the side pod push air outward, an angled strake was also added in the inside of the side pod there, which just helps to further force some of the air coming off of the fender out from the side of the car. Now I'm not entirely happy with the airflow around the side pods, but it really doesn't make a material difference to the overall performance of the car. An elegant solution that is utilized by the Praga R1 and the Porsche LMDH cars is to actually remove the body between the fender and the monocoque, thus getting rid of this area of low pressure, and it gives the air coming off the front wing more time to reattach to the body. But however, just due to the structural limitations on this car and design aesthetics, I didn't choose to implement this approach. Obviously, I could have added some carbon fiber rods or a strut to support the fender. But like I said, the aerodynamic gains were marginal at best, so maybe a future project. It's worth noting that the monocoque has two large cooling inlets that are also helping out with the flows around the side pod. These cooling outlets are strategically positioned around the inside of the rear tires drawing ample air through the monocoque. So before we leave the side pods, I do want to talk real quick about vortices. They do actually generate a counter-rotating vortice to the vortice coming off of the front wing and the canards. If you have two vortices rotating the same direction, they'll actually just merge together and form one big vortex. But if you have two counter-rotating vortices, uh, they won't merge and they actually push each other apart. So the goal with the side pods is actually to generate that counter-rotating vortice. If you take a look, the area behind the rear tires is particularly interesting. In early prototypes, there's a full body panel that goes all the way to the rear of the car, whereas in the CFD model, this section has been removed. And this is because I found that the rear suspension installation process was a time-consuming nightmare, requiring long forceps and infinite levels of patience. To alleviate this issue, I considered making the back portion of the tail removable, not unlike a full-size prototype race car. However, due to the complexity of the rear wing supports and the rear monocoque, this would end up adding another 60 to 80 grams to put all the fasteners and everything in there that I would need. Ultimately, I just cut off that section of the body behind the tire uh, so I could access the rear suspension. This ended up barely reducing the downforce at the rear. It did slightly increase drag and ultimately it also eliminated 20 grams of plastic. So sometimes the easiest solution is the best. After the last video, someone asked me about venting fresh air from the side pod around the inside of the rear fender and over the top of the diffuser outlet like many prototype race cars do today. I did try to do this with an earlier design. I just found it didn't work for this particular car, and I think that's mostly because the diffuser is just so tall. The top of the diffuser is almost the same height as the rear bodywork, so there's a huge amount of upwash fresh air that was just coming over the top of the tail, and it, this air was much more effective than the air coming from around the sides of the side pod, which had already been used up by the front wing. The rear wing is probably the car's most dominant feature. The rear wing plays a crucial role in generating downforce and enhancing the overall stability of the car. The primary objective when designing a rear wing is to strike the perfect balance between generating sufficient downforce for increased traction in the rear and maintaining the aero balance with the front of the car. The first step in the design process involves determining the ideal shape and dimensions of the rear wing. I knew that I wanted a full width rear wing and that allowed me to tie the end plates of the wing into the body structure to make the rear wing as strong as possible. So designing the rear wing itself was not a straightforward process as the rear wing of the car had such a strong interaction with the underfloor of the car. Rear downforce on the car, it was very sensitive to the placement and the strength of the low pressure zone under the rear wing. So it was really trial and error for me to figure out both the design and the placement of the rear wing. I started off with some real rough designs of the rear wing with the various numbers of elements and angles of attack and ran them all through CFD to see how they performed. I had a rough idea of what I thought the weight distribution of the car would be and ended up being fairly close. And I did my best to create the maximum downforce I could at the rear 
and still maintain the correct balance of the car. In general, a car with too much rear downforce is easier to drive because the car will understeer rather than oversteer in high speed maneuvers. And if you have too much downforce on the rear, it's really easy to trim back the rear wing or try a different rear wing. So I fairly quickly arrived at a two element rear wing for a couple of reasons. First, the reason you use a multi-element wing in general is because you can generate more downforce in a smaller physical package. This is because the gap between the elements allows for the boundary layer to be re-energized with fresh air, which keeps the air attached at a much higher overall angle of attack between all of the elements. I did try initially to use a very large single element rear wing, which is more efficient but it was a lot harder to package because it was almost six inches, maybe even seven inches long sticking off the back of the car. And it was also moving the low pressure region that was generated under the airfoil too far back and away from the diffuser. I designed a three element rear wing, but there's a minimum size that you can 3D print an airfoil that will span uh, nine inches or 23 centimeters and still be strong enough. So the three element design just generated too much downforce and it also weighed about 25% more than the two element. Now both airfoils used on the wing are the Motorsports high downforce airfoil again. Uh, with a multi-element wing, the first element receives the most high energy air. So you typically run a larger airfoil with a shallower angle of attack to preserve some of that energy for the later airfoils. There are a lot of great papers on multi-element rear wing design created by FSAE race car teams. For initial models, I just copied some of their wing angles and I ran the design through CFD and actually optimized from there. Now, one interesting thing is how the rear wing is actually backed off in the middle. In a typical race car, you might back off the wing as it approaches the end plates to reduce the drag and the vortices being thrown off by the wing. In Formula Student, you see this backed off mid wing because the driver's head typically blocks part of the air going to the rear wing. I didn't know at the time why FSA teams uh, backed the wing off in the middle, but I went ahead and tried it in CFD and lo and behold, it produced more downforce and less drag than a straight wing uh, with either a higher or shallower angle of attack. I studied the pressure distribution along the wing, uh, which despite being backed off in the middle is actually quite even. My theory is that there's more fresh air coming down the middle of the car because of the uh, way the front wing works. So a shallower angle of attack in the middle works better and actually lets more air flow over the top of the diffuser. So if anyone has some theories as to why this works, uh, let me know in the comments. As you can see, the wing obviously has some very large end plates. These help to minimize the losses from the high pressure that's on top of the airfoils, uh, trying to travel around to the low pressure below the airfoil. Their shape and size were a compromise between their effectiveness and their weight. The end plates have a couple of interesting features on them. The first are these, I don't know, vortex generators or canards. I don't know the exact name of these devices. They serve a similar purpose to the louvers in the wing end plates you might see on a lot of race cars. But when you look at race cars with an unlimited rear wing width, you'll often see devices like these on the end plates. These devices help to break up the wing tip vortices as they come over the top of the end plate into smaller vortices, uh, which end up having a lot less drag. These also generate downforce by interfering with the high pressure air as it's trying to travel down the length of the end plate. It harnesses some of that energy for, as the air tries to curl around and as the vortex actually ends up rolling up underneath these devices, uh, it generates some low pressure under them as well. Around the rear of the end plate is a gurney flap. I like to think of gurney flaps as kind of a virtual extension of a surface but at an angle. Uh, in this case, the gurney creates some outwash around the uh, edges of the end plate, uh, which helps with air extraction uh, from under the wing, uh, particularly when the car is in yaw or is turning. The other important feature of the wing end plates is how that affects the car's center of pressure in yaw. The end plates act a lot like a rudder or a tail on an airplane, 
and they actually generate a side force on the rear of the car of actually a few hundred grams at high speed. This helps to st further stabilize the car and really prevent it from being able to spin around at high speeds. Probably the most noticeable feature when you're driving this car is that it's immensely more stable and controllable at speed. And much of this is attributable to the uh, rear biased center of pressure generated by those rear wing end plates. This last bit is the swan neck, which I kind of have a love-hate relationship with, but it's there for structural reasons and to stiffen the wing side to side. Uh, it does help to move the center of pressure uh, rearward on the car. Ideally, someday I'd like to remove this and try to use a carbon fiber a spar inside the rear wing airfoils. Now that was a lot of aerodynamics to throw into one video, and I kind of wanted to force my way through all this because ultimately I haven't done enough real world testing of this car and we're going to have to make tweaks to the aerodynamics uh, along the way. It's clear that the videos don't fully capture the sheer speed and difficulty of driving this RC car. The steering reacts instantly. It's overwhelming to try and both watch the car and look ahead uh, hundreds of feet. I managed to crash the car into my foot on two occasions already. Clearly this car demands a vast amount of space and ideally a smooth surface. The hypercar's peak downforce levels have already far surpassed the initial goals. Remarkably, the current cornering limitations for the car stem from the suspension and tires inability to use that much downforce. With this in mind, the focus of the next video will be to continue to refine the aerodynamics of the car and actually build an aero map for the car, specifically examining how the aerodynamics and forces change with the car's attitude, basically it's pitch, roll, and yaw. The goal of this is to try to make the car even more stable and to ensure the aerodynamic forces stay balanced over various conditions. So if you guys have any questions or would like to delve deeper into a particular topic of aerodynamics on the car, you know, feel free to let me know in the comments section. Uh, once again, I have to extend my gratitude to Airshaper for their invaluable assistance throughout this build. So until next time, stay safe out there.